my plan has been to talk about calendar today my calendar we're actually having two meetings on time and calendar there is this one which is sort of the basics my numbers and calendar and then there's a more advanced later in the year when we know a little bit more about higher web so we can talk about time philosophy difference between knowing how to count and which day of the week it is versus the meaning of ill. So the meaning comes later. Today is just basics, but still there's a lot of glyphs. Uh, so bear with me. Okay. okay. This is today's date. Someone familiar with the readings for today? Can you read it? Can someone read it for me? This Saturday today in the long count system. What about this number? 13. 13. So 13 400 year periods, Bakhtuns, uh, or as actually they're called in hieroglyph inscriptions, peak. Then what about this? Zero. Zero. Now, can someone tell me why we're in zero cartoons in zero 20 year periods right now? What happened 80 years ago? Because the next sign is eight, eight years, 2012. Oh, the end of the, uh... the end of the world, right? So 13 cartoons, 13 400 year periods completed. So we're still living in the zero cartoon. So zero 20 year periods have elapsed since that date. So we're still in zero and uh, it's been eight years. So eight, 15 months and three days since that event in which the world didn't end, but moved on precisely eight years, 15 months and three days. That's how my account time in the long count. Now, this is something else. This is 260 day cycle. So we are today in the day to darkness. To darkness. Cha akbal. Uh, and uh, this is uh, equivalent of our calendar. So the solar calendar, right? So we are in September, September 8th. Uh, this is day one, which would be second day in our system because the first day is zero. Uh, of the month, black wind, or the wind of the east, or the rain making god of the east. Uh, oh, sorry, not the east, west, west. So black sea home. So we're in the second day of the month of black sea home, the day to darkness. Uh, nobody knows how to read those, but it's something about nine fetuses. Uh, those gods have very strange names. Some of my gods have strange names. Uh, uh, these are the so-called nine lords of the night. That's how Aztecs called them. Unfortunately, by the time the Spaniards arrived, there were no Maya people using the system. So we're a little bit uh, at odds at how, how the same thing functions. But they also accompanied by this glyph, which means si hun na, literally mouth of the headband, or mouth of the paper or edge of the paper. So they are at the edge of the paper, which is kind of weird, but until you imagine something like a chart. So uh, this is their position in the chart, some kind of celestial ordering. So this is a nine day week. That's the patron of the nine day week. So that's basically how to, a typical mile would like, you know, in boots are in, hello, good day. What time is it now? And they was like, well, you know, which cycle? It's like long count or 160 day system or the solar year or the nine day week. And those are the basic time cycles. There's still the 219 day cycle, the cycle of the maze gods, the cycle of the fire gods, and uh, the lunar calendar, which is very important, even today. So uh, these are my numbers. They're bars and dots, pretty straightforward. Now there is one remarkable thing about these numbers. These are abstract numbers. Now we are trained to recognize abstract numbers since being kids. There's nothing intuitive about abstract numbers. Like when you grow up as you know as a toddler. It's actually hard to explain the concept of abstract quantity, right? So like three apples is the same thing as three oranges somehow, or like three cups and three plates. 
I mean, they look different. Many languages have different words for numbers, depending on what you are counting. Uh, and uh, many early writing systems, in fact, didn't use the same counting system for all the objects. So in ancient Near East, the place that is most documented for the history of accounting systems, because they use cuneiform tablets and wrote on clay and clay preserves really well, we know that it took almost 1,000 years to get from a system of non-abstract numbers to abstract numbers. So to understand the concept of abstract quantity was a very gradual process, and we still live with it. Say, we use a 60-day system for counting time. That's a legacy of non-abstract numbers because there were different systems for counting different kinds of things. And they're actually different words too. And so in timekeeping, because it's so traditional, it kind of survived to this day, a 60 base uh, counting system with its own units of time, right? And we still use it, even though we have a 10 base system and have different words for numbers in the same base system, all like minutes, hours, and days, and so on. Um, so in Mesoamerica, all numbers are abstract and we don't know how it happened from the earliest examples of the inscription. Uh, so the system must have evolved very quickly, independently, obviously, of the old world. And it's, it's quite amazing that it kind of happens. In the old world, in all of the old world, Near East, Africa, Mesopotamia, maybe after numbers were, were invented only once, like in the Near East and then diffused. There's, not no, there's no way to prove it, but we have one place with early abstract numbers and everything else is later. Um, these are Maya words. Some of them have more than one pronunciation, usually the kuchu difference and the soft h disappearing. So you have like hun, but then ka o cha, ush o hush, kan o chan, ho, wak, wuk o huk, washak, bolon, lahun, buluk, lachcha. And then you actually see, just like in English, the numbers after 12, they become like 13, 14. So you have the teen, lahun, for 10, and then the same words from one to basically nine, right? So sorry, from three to nine. So like ush lahun, 13, chan lahun or kan lahun, 14, ho lahun, 15, and so on. So pretty straightforward, as a matter of fact. Now, Maya numbers may have extensional meanings. Like kun, one can also mean like only, unique. Bolon, many, eternal, like endless. Like as we would say, countless. This is my favorite Maya god, the rain god of endless drinking or like eternal drunkenness. Because, uh, and it's actually a, uh, a modern Maya term, karanet from Turkey that I, that I know is this could mean like constantly drunk. Uh, and and uh, Bolon, that nine drunkenness or like many or countless drunkenness, it's a rain god. And believe it or not, this sacrificial bone for drawing blood. So when you want to make offerings of your blood to the god of endless drinking, it's what you do. And it was found in a royal grave. So I guess offerings to the god of endless drinking uh, had to be made. And it's a rain deity, which is also interesting. You kind of wonder, like, like uh, Chuck is drinking, vomiting, drinking, vomiting. The big hail falls. Is it like when the Chuck of eternal drinking has a bit too much? And you see harder pieces on the ground. Uh, but I don't know, it, but uh, not too many references to these important DT. I guess being a follower was hard. Because the, 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 the emphasis on eternal, no breaks, no rest, never sober. Uh, anyways. Uh, my uh, numbers do have variants which refer to certain gods, and we don't know how the system works, to be fair to say. It seems to be some kind of number philosophy game. Say, corn is one, maize god, number one, and his name is actually one corn. It makes sense, right? Corn is everything if you live in Central America. The first thing, it's the last thing. Uh, in fact, there is a god whose name is one corn lord of darkness. I guess it's the anti-corn. And he seems to be responsible for the death of the sun. But uh, 
So I guess the only thing less important than corn or like as important, but on the other side of things is evil corn, but still corn. But it tells you everything about like what really matters, like what we call cultural salience, right? If you're a Maya person, it's corn. Even if you're mostly eating potatoes, which is kind of interesting, still corn. And animals, for example, important animals are the ones who can eat corn because they're pests. If an animal is not eating corn, there may not be a name for that animal because who cares about it anyway? Uh, so uh, same for birds and bugs. Uh, everything is around the cornfield. So that's why it's one. No idea what happens with this fellow. Uh, this is wind. Why winds come in threes? It's hard for me to tell, but in Central America, there are usually three important directions of wind. The west, the east, and the north. Can you guess why someone living in Bataan, Guatemala wouldn't care about southern winds? Uh, not exactly. You have, you have mountains, right? If you're Guatemalan Highlands, the Pacific weather system does not affect you. So you don't care how the wind blows from the south and almost never does anyway. It's the eastern and the western and the northern winds that you, you have to worry about because they relate to the monsoon system and the rains. So perhaps the winds come in threes. Uh, sun is number four. Sun has four roads. Solstice, solstice, equinox, equinox. So actually there's a common saying, four are the roads of the sun. In fact, sometimes sun god is depicted with like a little title, four roads. Uh, five, that's the god of evil month. Five unhappy days. At the end of the year, of 365 days. The last five days is the time of lawlessness. It's when you're not supposed to do anything because the gods are basically transitioning from the patron of one year to the patron of the next year. It's like right after elections, when it's still being contested, you don't want to start anything because you don't know which administration is in charge. You're not supposed to travel during the five unhappy days or the five evil months, the days of the evil month. So that's number five. Uh, these fellas, I have no idea. This is one of the hero twins, for example. That's is the dad god. Why the dad god is number 10, I have no idea. Uh, this is the Maya sign for 20, which looks either like a moon crescent, so just a moon, like basically a crescent, or as a sign for person. And of course, Maya system and all Mesoamerican systems are based 20 systems, because as some people joke, when you're in the tropics, it's very easy to count, like fingers, toes. And in fact, Maya are not wearing any footwear that is covering the toes. Even like elite people are always wearing something that has their toes open. You can appreciate the quality of their nail work on both fingers and toes, which is very important if you're a high level Maya person, basically. Uh, uh, and, uh, and this is another word for 20, which is kal, just written syllabically, kal. Kal means 20, but unique means both 20 and person. A person is something that is 20. The 20 is also a human dimension of numbers. Right? Also 20 is one score of years, very much like in many European languages, right? So uh, two score, three score, three score person is an average lifespan. Uh, I mean, aspirational in the Asian world, of course. Uh, this is the sign for zero that looks like a dark flower of sorts. With like four petals, sometimes you, the fourth petal is extracted, the cut away by the nearby sign. Sometimes this is just a very fancy syllable, he, as, as a clue, so me, he, nothing. And, and this is a hand holding a shell. And I have no idea why hand holding a shell and that is nothing, maybe because it's an empty shell. Uh, and towards the end, uh, the pause class here, the, just the little shell is the zero sign. That's very much as in the example that I showed you, right? That shell, that's the easiest way to write zero. Now, zero is also a highly abstract concept, like notion of nothingness, emptiness, zero place in positional notation. It's quite amazing that uh, people in Mesoamerica came up with it. Uh, now, how you write 20 uh, with numbers, it's a little confusing because ideally in my language, when you want to say 21, you actually say one and 20. But in my writing, that begins to contradict with the positional system because we want, if we want to count 20s, you would want to say 120 and one. And unfortunately that creates a confusion 
And so we have both examples present in my writing. So this is 120 Hun Winik, literally one score or just Winik. And this is uh, Winik Cha or Winik Ka, 22. But this is also uh, Wak Winik, 26 and not six times 20. So those would be like aberrant spellings, but they're closer to actual pronunciation. And that's interesting because it's just the basic notation is not based on language. It's abstract, like positional notation, very much like ours. Uh, in codices, in post-classic manuscripts, higher units, higher than 20, are recorded using non-positional notation. So they just put a lot of 20 signs together, right? Twice 20, four times 20. And that's not how we do it. This is more how we do it. This is a king from the site of Arroyo de Piedra who claims to have come either from a very long dynasty, Asian dynasty, or a dynasty of very unlucky people. Because he is five and three times 20 king. So in succession, Agul. So he's the 65th king to succeed. So either there has been a very ancient line of kings. Well, they all have very short lifespans. They're like very, very unlucky kings, like five or six years at the most. Quick, quick, quick rotation. And in fact, it does happen with small kingdoms in the Maya area. Uh, too much politics. Uh, so when it comes to numbers, higher numbers, there is this number peak. And it's very confusing because it actually means 8,000. But in the calendar notation, it refers to 400 years, which is very weird. But linguistically, it's 8,000. In non-calendar, it counts as 8,000. But in the calendar, it refers to 400 long count years. And it seems to be perhaps that it, as at least David Stewart argued, that it just reflects a position in the positional system, not necessarily a specific quantity. Uh, there is no confirmed glyph for 400, which is very confusing. But that's about the nature of our record. We don't have my accounting books. So when people present like items like jewelry, special gifts, they're usually under 400 in quantity. They're in 20s. And when people present high value items, which are high quantity sort of items like cacao beans, they're already in 8,000. So in terms of what the text actually report, there seems to be like a gap in numbering just because of the nature of the surviving record on like stone monuments and pottery vessels. Probably the term is buck. When we put little asterisks, uh, asterisk when we're not sure how to, whether or not the term actually exists. And we have counts of captive, which use a number, which seems to be neither 20 nor 8,000. So maybe that's what it is. But since we have no confirmation, like full phonetic spelling uh, or some kind of astronomical text that actually has it, uh, unfortunately, uh, we're not sure. But in positional notation, when numbers have been counted, we do have it, so, but just as a simple number without the actual words attached to it. Uh, one thing about all the Mayan languages, and it's very different from English, something that English does not have. English does not have numeral classifiers. So when you count in Mayan languages, you actually add a little suffix to the number. And that suffix places whatever you are counting into some broader category. My favorite example is, say, in Shorty, there is a, a, a suffix walker, and it actually refers to roundish pebble-like objects and rocks. So every time you use it with a number, it basically tells that you're counting something rock-like. So, so you may not necessarily mention what you're counting, but your, whoever you're talking with will know. So it's kind of a classification system. And some mind languages have a lot of these classifiers, other Mayan languages have a few, but all of them have some. Classic Mayan scriptures do not have a lot of classifiers, and they use them in very uh, non-uniform way, very inconsistently, and that probably implies that you were just supposed to put them when you're reading. Like they're not required in writing. So like when you read numbers, it's just like we do, like we write, we write first and sometimes just write one or put little ST, we don't necessarily have to write first every time we want to say first rather than one. It's mostly obvious from context. So something like this seems to be happening with the Maya. So Maya way to say first would be to add 
qualifier tau, like home tau. Or when it's in a line of sequence of something, like succession, tak. Uh, so, but they won't use it necessarily in writing. You're supposed to know it, where to put it. And there's a generic tick, but it seems to come with almost all of the possible numbers. And then these are reserved for very small counts. Uh, and tequila seems to be for people, but only in the west part of the Maya area. So not a very common numeral classifier. So here's an example. Day eight of the month of Pash, Washak Te Pash. So presumably every time you mention something in the calendar, you're actually supposed to say Te, but uh, you don't have to write it down. Or here, for use, Chan, Te, Choko, Tak. Tak is a plural suffix. Ok, youth, literally someone who is unripe. So you can be technically 50 years old and still called a young person because say you don't have a job. So they would say, well, that person is still a chok. And because it's not really about biological age, it's about like what happens to your life. Is there maturity or not? Uh, well, these are gods, so they're perpetually chok. Uh, and uh, dark is a reverential plural, which is absent in most my languages today, only in Turkey preserves it. And only when you talk about gendered beings, men, women, children. Uh, so, and here, these are gods, chante, choktak, for youth. Uh, this is one of my favorite Maya numbers. It's a place name. Can you guess what this is? What about this? Scorpion, and that? It's in my hieroglyph. Mountain. So Scorpion Mountain. Now we have a number here. So three and then this. Not 20. Peak, yes. And 8,000. And then the, the classifier. Three times 8,000. The mountain of 24,000 scorpions. Imagine that place. Apparently, somewhere near the town of Tonina in Chiapas, Mexico, there is a mountain. We're in Chiapas Highlands, so there are mountains there. But there was a mountain with a special reputation. <laughs> really a lot of scorpions. Like, I cannot imagine 20, 24,000 scorpions in one place. But someone could. And they, you know, had it in the record. Uh, so, Hushte Peak Sinan Wheats, the mount of 24,000 scorpions. Uh, this is someone who is the 16th in the royal line. So the 16th king, or in this case, he calls himself a 16th priest. Wat Lahun Tak Chahom, 16th Chahom. Uh, so another numeral classifier. Now, returning to our main subject calendar. So this is a typical Maya monument, still a B from Kofan, and half of the monument is date. There's a lot of dates, but this is a monument to celebrate the passage of time. Remember, during our virtual tour, we did like still a J and the importance of the 20-year cycle. So it kind of makes sense that there'll be a lot of calendar on those. Uh, so at first, you get what we call the initial series introductory glyph. We don't know how to read it. it hasn't been deciphered. It always has a little extra character. Who is the god who is in charge of the solar month, in this case, the month Hulol or Kumko, right here. So this is the long count. Uh, this is the 260 day cycle, the nine day week. Uh, this is the, sol, uh, the, the 218 day cycle, so we're not talking about it. And then the lunar cycle, and then finally the 365. So that's kind of a short list of possible ways to count time in the Maya line on typical formal monument. This one is nine. To kind of figure out it was a long time ago because now we're in 13, this is nine, right? So a lot of time passed since 730 something and, and 2021. Uh, and then 14, 19, and six, uh, eight months, and then zero days. Uh, Long count is not technically astronomical, what we would say tropical years. It's very important to remember. 
it uses, it's basically an abstract system. It counts time since a random point in the past, very much like present day astronomy counts used for observations. Very handy when you want to use it to observe celestial objects. So you're not tied to a particular imperfect counting system like a tropical year that you that have to add leap years or anything to actually make it conform to the actual passage of time. So it's abstract. And long count years, they only contain 360 days to make it easier to count. So they drop this five day thing. So it means that compared to our years or 20s of years or 400 of years, there's a growing gap between our years and the long count years. Yeah. So like how would they be able to keep track of seasons then over time? That's a good point. And we'll come to that. But basically no, no, no calendar in the my area is keeping track of seasons except the lunar calendar. This is the only calendar that is actually designed to be accurate. And believe it or not, even today, if you live in Central America, uh, your agricultural activities are tied to the lunar calendar, not to the solar calendar, because solar calendar is an imperfect indicator. I mean, you generally know the seasons anyway. And then in terms of when the rains are going to come, it varies from year to year from up to like two months. So it means you rely more on the wind direction, on how plants and animals behave uh, so solar calendar has other purposes like 4th of July, Labor Day, Christmas. Make sure that you have shared experience with the community on certain days, like Sundays always happen, have to happen on Sundays, right, for everyone. Uh, so uh, that's the role of the solar calendar. Um, uh, but the lunar calendar is important. Phases of the moon are important for farmers. The time when you cut wood, for example, or leaves for a roof have to be coordinated with moons. Uh, it actually affects the amount of the healthiness of the tree, the amount of like stuff in the tree, according to popular knowledge, right? So people will wait sometimes three or four weeks before cutting wood for buildings, especially, so that they hit the right time in the moon cycle. And same goes for planting, for farmers, all kinds of things. So those things, they have to be accurate down to like days, uh, but, not, but not all this stuff. This is basically more like, days of the week for us, right? As long as we just keep track of them, that's all we need to do. Um, so this is just some of the long count sign variants. So the initial series glyph with a patron, a lot of them are birds for some reason, except the units for months, turtle, uh, sorry, yeah, turtle or some sort, and days, monkeys. Uh, so the, we don't know, don't know why. Uh, so uh, of course, this is the beginning. When a hearth was replaced at the beginning of the current cycle. And of course, we're living in the 14th, 400 year period of that current cycle. Now it's very important to remember that the current cycle is, is part of an even larger period of time. This is the largest unit in the full, so-called full long count since the beginning of time, according to the Maya. So it's 30 times 20, 20 multiplied by 20, 21 times. We don't have words for numbers of that magnitude. But that's how Maya priests imagined the full length of time. Not infinity, but very close to that. And they saw their current cycle of 13, 400 year periods, which is the tiniest speck within this infinity. But at the same time, they believed that the infinity had a kind of heartbeat. Certain days of the 260 day system, they're basically similar. Certain 20 year periods are similar across this man's span of time. So a person who is you know, provided with that knowledge can orient oneself in this ever repeating set of cycles stretching to this extensive number. Which of course takes us to the 260 day cycle. And I already mentioned that this is a very, very important cycle for Miss America. So like our days of the week, but except it of course has 260 options and it's divination, right? It's this notion of time and destiny, right? Time and destiny. So Maya people, when cornered by the Spanish priests were asked, are you still counting days? Do you still make it the foundation of your life? Like, and it, you know, very important questions. And despite all the opposition from the Christian church, this practice survived in many parts of Central America. Like there's still Maya people counting days. 
and still making it the foundation of their life. Now, of course, compared to seven days of the week, 260 sounds like a lot. So the system is a bit more complicated. But in a nutshell, it's just basic content, right? Like days of the week. Just have to know where you are. Just have to keep the tables. And every Maya priest would have a little notebook with a chart, right? Where you keep notation, where you know which day you're in. And then each day would have certain things to do, like certain prognostications about uh, people born on that day, about things you can do on that day. Aztecs called it Tonalpo Wale, literally the count of soul, because your soul is assigned, part of your soul is assigned on the day of your birth. Yes. Yes, except the astrology, you watch the planet and you think that the cycles of the planet, uh, you know, determine your life. Here, you know, plants actually come and go. Like the current plants are about 13 times, you know, 400 years old. Before that, there were other planets. But this system has always been there. It was never created, except for the really ends of years ago. It's kind of interesting, right? So it's like, yeah, one, one colleague of mine, who's especially in this American region, he doesn't like this idea that this is important, so he's a bit skeptical. But he goes, well, it's just the heartbeat of the universe. Now, to me, like, heartbeat of the universe is a pretty big thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there are 20 day names. Some of them we know what they mean. All cultures of Central America, pre Columbian Central America, had this system. It's shared, although day names may vary. From, from system to system. Uh, and say, uh, ask the word for the day Lord is the day wine flower. But some of the hieroglyphs are shared across multiple cultures. So this hieroglyph actually shows the bud of a flower, even though the Maya word for it is Lord. And when the logogram is used separately in writing, it's just bud of a flower. Uh, so, so it seems that there's a kind of shared cultural background. I mean, literally, people in Central America lived on the same ritual schedule. They counted days. Like, you, you could ask someone, like, like we would ask, like, are you like a Taurus? Are you, I don't know, a Gemini? Here people would say, are you like two Lord or a three Lord? I'm not sure. Uh, because, because that's how they would think about people like you each day has its own character. And that's why the day signs are literally surrounded by this carpet. That means like basically a blob of blood that drips over because blood contains your soul. These are soul days. That's what it's supposed to mean. Um, so you have 13 numbers and 20 names. So you go one inish, two ik, three akbal, and so on until you get through all the numbers. Then the numbers resume, but the days continue, the names continue until you get back to Inish. So within the full cycle, there is always one plus the same name, but it falls differently, right? This is the, the, full, the full length. So the actual way to think about is that these are actually 13 day weeks. Each week falls on a unique name of the day, one of the 20 day names. So the one Inish week is followed by one Tish week, is followed by one Manik week, and one Akal week. So each week is unique because it doesn't contain the same day names, right? Uh, and then each week has its own nature based on the first day. So say Jaguar is generally a bad day. So the week one Jaguar is the worst week of the 260 day period. And all of the days in it are bad. So a how is generally a good day, but not seven a how that falls within the one Jaguar week. But it's not as bad as the first day of the week. That is the absolutely worst day, right? You kind of get the idea. So the significance of the day depends on which week you're in and which day it is. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just making sure. So Jaguar and Nisan, like the 260 days, like the Jaguar day? Yeah, the Jaguar day. So it's like Monday, their version of Monday is like the first day, lands on the Jaguar day, that whole week. Yeah. 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so it's basically like taking our days, except putting you have to basically take our seven day weeks plus they have these names, except that these weeks are 13 day weeks and there are 20 possibilities. So essentially it's a cycle of 20, 13 day weeks. So when each week is characterized by the name on which the beginning of the week falls, and then whatever falls inside, but each combination will be unique to that particular week. Uh, this is from a Maya timekeeping book, and that's how it looks, right? Day five, it's not. It's good. There's rain. It's the day for beans, lima beans, watermelon, all melons. Uh, six kawak, truly good day. It's a good day for all gardens also. Seven a how, evil, not a good day. And remember, they're in uh, the evil week in general, but some of the evil weekdays, they're okay. Except seven and a half, bad day, right? So imagine you're a farmer and you decide on when to plant. So you see signs in the air, but there's still some uncertainty. Uh, you know, ants are behaving like the rainy season is about to begin, but all the cedar trees, uh, cedar trees are not sprouting yet. You kind of doubt. You go to a priest and the priest opens the book. Okay, well, the next day is seven and a half. Definitely not tomorrow. Uh, well, come back in two, you know, a couple of days and plant. And of course, it's also a polite way to say no. When Cortez famously traveled through Lake Patan and, and asked, uh, demanded from local lords to basically declare themselves vassals of the Spanish crown, local lords said, oh yeah, we told them board with you. Yes, 100%, we want to be vassals. But right now, this 20 year cycle is really bad for that. Come back in 20 years. Basically, in secretly hoping that the mad Spaniards are going to you know, be wiped out on their you know, mission. Then they helped build the bridges for the Spaniards to cross to Macinta and, and carefully dismantled the bridges after the Spanish step, you know? So, so yeah, so it's just, it's, you know, that's how people think, right? They don't say they believe in it, but they do to some extent. And in this otherwise very chaotic life full of unpredictable things, that kind of gives you a sense of control, right? At least you have something to do. When in doubt, use the manual. Uh, to the heartbeat of the universe. This is our day today from the same manual. The book of John Balam of Chantan, it says, Kakbal Nob, Mautsi, Manhab, Lauds, Set a key, Usutuk to Malakin, to Akbal, Lob, Evil, Mauts, not good, Manhab, no time, I guess, for anything. Like today, not a good time for anything. Uh, Lauds, little good, like, Something may come out of this day, but uh, not guaranteed. Uh, and then it's a key with the optative. You should, this is not the language of my heart, this is Yucatec, slightly different. You rather should change Usutuk to Malakin, your direction to the east, like to the sun, I guess. Like look east to the new day, I guess. Like basically, if you plan something for today, Consider the next sunrise as a better option. The next day is Oshkan and it's a good day. And it may even rain. Uh, so I guess that's the message basically. Look to the east. So if you planned anything, just know, according to my books today, uh, probably not, probably shouldn't. They usually have a disclaimer, right? Like this one has like clouds, you know, Little good may come out of it. So, but yeah. Mitigation measures or just avoid. Yeah, or cheat. Um, on cheating, imagine you were born on the day one Jaguar. You're gonna be a cannibal, a murderer, a pervert person, an eater of human flesh. Now, it's a disaster. What should parents do? Well, some parents would cheat the system and postpone the naming ceremony for a couple of days, hoping, you know, that the good tonal will pass. That's what parents do, always, you know, better options for the kid. Now, the Aztec source on the subject says that there are mitigation measures that you can take. It says, even though you were born on such a horrible fortune, you can mitigate by uh, diligence, 
Do not sleep too much. Make sure you do penance and fast and cut yourself for bloodletting, you know, sacrificing for the gods, uh, taking blood from your body and weeping uh, the house, keeping the house clean and uh, making sure there's light at night. So you can compensate. You may be given a really bad option in life. In your nature, be a bloodthirsty murderer. But diligence, do not oversleep. Cut yourself in time for the gods. Do not eat too much. Be clean. And there's chance. There's still chance in life. This is Aztec notion of like destiny versus choice, nature versus nurture. Uh, kind of pre-Columbian understanding that we are born to certain destiny, but it's not a given. Uh, it's there is still an option. Just if you are born on this day, you'll have to strive harder not to basically descend into your nature, which is unpleasant for everyone, including yourself. So uh, this is what the system is all about. Now, uh, the next cycle is 365 days. It's very straightforward, superficially so. The trick with that cycle is that it has all these names, like the month of Mo, literally the gathering month, when people gather to plant, then there is a month of avocados, presumably harvesting avocados. There are the month, the west winds, the southern winds, the first winds, suggesting association with rains and rain-making deities, except that it's a 365-day year with no leap years, which means it's off by one day every four years. And now imagine that this calendar came into being about 4 500 BC. So by 100 AD, it was off. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting. Say today, when people use 260 day system, they still count days broadly the same across the region. They're only by one or two days off, which is remarkable, right? Because there's no, no authority, no, nobody's telling people what to do. So it's just continuous counting since basically 500 BC, at least. Um, so just like different regions, like different Maya regions, to use different sites. Like what we use in Vietnam? No, they use all of them all at the same time. Well, I don't know how that works in practice. We know that my people had a class of scientists called obsidians, and they were mutually recognized across my region. So presumably these people communicated and kept books. That's how people usually share information. If you have books, it's much easier to fall to you know, basically work on, uh, on the same data sets and make sure that things are uniform. Once, of course, the say, classic period civilization collapses, there's a lot more disagreements. So today, Highland Maya cal calendars are a couple of days off compared to the Northern Lowlands. And presumably that mistake was introduced sometime around 900 AD when a lot of late classic civilizations in the middle between the Northern Highlands and the, uh, the Northern Lowlands and the Southern Highlands actually collapsed. So there are these differences, but they're relatively small. And that's remarkable, right? I mean, this, this is just, it's like a little miracle in itself that people believe in all those things and relatively similar beliefs and kind of all these numbering system, they still match. There was enough communication and interest in making sure that everyone is on the same board. Like information flow was happening basically between all of these communities. Uh, now, Maya calendar keepers, they do make mistakes. Luna calendar sometimes entails a lot of back calculations. When you know, talk about Asian events and you wanna tell the age of the moon, <laughs> the face of the moon. And we see a lot of calculation mistakes in those which suggests that I mean, not everyone was perfect. But uh, sort of up-to-date dates usually are fine, like basically. You can go to any Maya site and they use the same long count and all the dates match, which is great for us because we have like better dating system than any Asian civilization who would usually say, well, in the reign of the king so-and-so and sometimes those would be different reigns, different kings and who knows what. And here everything is down to a day, which is remarkable, right? So, and, and, and remarkably so, very few discrepancies, like different people reporting different things about the same event. 
precisely because there's so much information flow. There's no point lying when everybody knows the truth, especially if you're not like one big nation state and can enforce big propaganda on everyone. It's more like you, it's all about polishing the facts rather than lying outright when it comes to my inscriptions. But we'll talk about that. Now, the thing about this calendar though, the solid calendar is that it was constantly off. So sometimes it was closer, so by 1000, AD, it was kind of closer again to what it was perhaps intended to be like, but then it was off again. So uh, solar calendar was never about you know, harvest time. Farmers already know that. But it was about synchronizing life, like having public holidays on the same date. And that had to be 365 so that they could basically correlate it with other important astronomical cycles, especially the 260-day calendar. In fact, the combination of 260-day cycle and the 600, uh, 365 creates what we call a calendar round, a unique combination of solar days and months and those days of the 260-day system. And those combinations repeat every 52 years. So, uh, so these are months of the year, uh, month pop. Uh, they're in, they're days, they start from zero to 19. So these are 20-day months. That's why they're called unique months, person, 20, or the 20s. Uh, and uh, so this is just some of the months, solar months. A lot of them have names that we don't quite understand. Like mole, new sun, originally was supposed to be associated with like solstices. Yes. So why do you find it on every month? Because it, they had to be close to the solar year, which is 304 plus something. Yeah. Uh, sorry, 364 plus something. So that's why it's five. And in this way, you have a common multiplier with 160, which is five. Yeah. And that creates a cycle of 52 years. So this is the easiest way to connect it to the cycle. So it's a kind of compromise. So you could basically tell that 260 has some placement in the solar cycle even though it's not perfect. And I'm sure the priest would say, well, maybe the next universe would be much better and the next solar cycle in the next universe would be okay. Uh, they thought that 360 thing was relatively recent, uh, you know, about 3000 BC when it happened. But uh, the 260 was before that. Okay. Weird. Uh, so some of these months have multiple names, say month if that's how it was called by Speakers of Yucatec when the Europeans arrived, and that's how it entered the literature. It's actually Chuck C. Holm in the glyphs. And it takes a lot of effort to remember that there are two words for everything. In fact, the only surviving colonial period manuscript about my writing, the Diego de Landes, uh, you know, description of Las Cosas de Yucatan, it actually has names of some of these months written in two languages, in Cholan and in Yucatec, the only document that does. Uh, and so uh, there, there's a paper that I reviewed recently that basically looks at their list in high res from the original manuscript and makes some comments on the spellings. But it's, it's very interesting. It's a kind of a bilingual clue uh, to how Maya uh, uh, scribes themselves dealt with the problem. It's like the month Ayab is actually recorded here as Kanasi. So very different words. Uh, but Wayeb or Wayhab, evil month, that's those five years, five days. And it's the the pincers of the underworld, the why, uh, the well, but also something that is evil. Uh, and hub is the word for time, year, but also month, because it's the month of the solar year, of the 365 uh, year, day year. So when months uh, begin, they sit, because they're like living beings, they're animate entities. So they sit down, and when they end, it's at the edge of the month, Tihab. So Tihad Yashkin is actually day zero of the next month of Mo. Uh, New Year's existed for the Maya too, although they usually happen when you know springtime is near. I mean, of course, because of the nature of the calendar, that ne didn't necessarily happen the way it's supposed to. But at the time of the Spanish arrival, that generally happened during springtime. Uh, and uh, the first uh, the first month is Pop or Kan Halab or Kan Takab literally precious succession uh, or precious mat or just the mat of rulership. Uh, and uh, uh, the day in this case is one win. So this is a new year monument. This is a Maya steel to celebrate the new year. 
And it actually was celebrated on two monuments. So I guess the party was especially big. And apparently it involved a lot of drumming. And here they say lokoi uh, tikok. They, uh, they strike with maybe deer hooves, deer antlers. And then this, 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 in, th in this case, they say yochilak uchumuk lakamtun is loosened the bowel of the stila, uh, ukabhi, and then names of kings who order it. And then uh, they drummer with big drums in the precious land of the fire god. The drums of the northern drummers, the southern drummers, those of Naranjo. This is the, the city where this monument is. So apparently just like our new year, this has to be a lot of fire cracking and sound and banging when Maya celebrated the new year. It's interesting. Okay? We want to celebrate with loud noises the passage of time. The fact that the year is over and the new year is about to begin. We kind of share this with the Asian Maya culture. Uh, now, as I mentioned, this solar year and the 260 day cycle, they converge. So unique combinations of those, we call them calendar rounds. So, so it, this is the 260 day cycle, right? The 13 numbers and the 20 day names. And then the big solar year. In the documentary about my decipherment, you see these kind of big whales turning with the cyclists. stars in the background, the, the cosmic system. Uh, Aztecs, we don't know what Mayas thought about the system, but they don't really mention any period of like new fire at the end of the 52 year cycle. Uh, Aztecs, of course, famously celebrated, oh, celebrate time is not the right word, but at the end of each 52 year cycle, they would switch off all the lights. And because the, go the gods would have such like a board meeting and they would basically contemplate, shall we like destroy the world this time? Shall we wait for another 52 years? There'd be a vote. And, uh, and then depending on that, uh, the world would be destroyed or just kept going. And humans would have no say in that. So Aztecs, for example, thought that huge female monsters from the stars called Tsitsimine, they look like huge tri creatures with enormous skulls filled with teeth. They would descend and, and devour everything uh, at the end of the world. Which could happen every 50 years. You switch off all the lights and you wait all night and you don't sleep because you know you don't want to miss the end of the world. Uh, and if nothing happens, uh, they kill someone, of course, uh, 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 on a certain mountain. And then they light up a fire on the chest of that person. And then they carry the fire to all the towns and provinces, and everybody lit their light house lights and, 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 and uh, hearths from that fire and uh, celebrates. Uh, that the world is not going to end. And it was also considered that if you live beyond 52 years, you kind of accumulated enough supernatural mojo, so you can start sorcery. And some communities would kill you preventively, just avoid that. If they feel like their like quota on sorcerers is currently full. Um, uh, we don't know if anything like that was happening with the Maya. But they also have the cycle. So this is an example. Six, Jaguar, 12, Yashkin. So that's how many Maya dates are written, which is a problem for us because uh, it repeats every 52 years. If you have a monument dated that way, you don't know actually when it happened, right? Could have happened you know, 450 or maybe 500 or maybe 550. So you have to rely on other means of dating the event, sometimes based on archeology, span sometimes based on other monuments or names of people. But say there are a couple of sites where people notoriously use the same names and the dating system like this. And that kind of creates a whole headache for like rules. Is it the first Yahao Chan Muan? Is it the second Yahao Chan Muan? Is it the third Yahao Chan Muan? And then they're all the same using the same date system. And you kind of start to build charts and figure out what's going on. Now, uh, because the common denominator, common multiply is five, the new year doesn't fall on all dates. And not all like number combinations are possible. Right? So the new year would only fall on four days. And those days we call them year bearers because they are like the patron of every new year. So in the classic period system, a new year, so the day of the sitting on the month of Pop, like those monuments here, it will always fall on the days earth, wind, Manik, I'm not sure how to read it, and Ab, don't have clear translations. 
those would be the bearers of the year and the patron of the year. But there are other possibilities. And it's interesting that at this point, you think like everyone would agree on when the new year begins, there is no agreement. So the new year begins on different days because the solar calendar and the 260 system, they're off by one or two days, basically. And that seems to be a real cultural difference. So answering your question about calendar. So this point, the, the, the beginning of the new year, there seems to be some cultural variation. And we have sites like the Great Cave of Nachtunich where pilgrims went to see the cave. And they left inscription with the dates. They use different systems. Because they come, some of them come from Novi Catan, some of them come from Central Catan. And it seems that they don't share this very basic notion of the day of the new year. Uh, they use, they, they have different beliefs, even though they come to the same pilgrimage location. There's also another extra complication here is that uh, when the day begins. So like we think of our days, we have 24 hours, but our day is just one thing. Now, these are actually different days. Like these are the days of the sun. The sun rises, the sun sets. You can count them based on whether it's from sunrise to sunrise, from sunset to sunset, from midday to midday. These are not sun days. They existed before the current sun. Uh, the Aztecs, for example, looked for the Pleiades to cross the zenith during the 52-year New Year cycle, suggesting that's how they measured the passage of these days. So they change at midnight. Although it's not clear if it's true for the Maya. But we know they don't end on the same time. They don't, they're not fully synchronized. There's probably about 12 hour difference between them and whether it's between, or six hour between noon and sunset or between sunrise or sunset. But we know that sometimes events happen and these things, they haven't matched yet. So when something happens in the middle of the night, this thing usually advances by one position, but the other, the, the Sunday has not. And so like nighttime events, we see this mismatch and they say yikin, which means midnight or the darkness of the night, uh, the darkness of the day, uh, then we know. And there's a system in which the other way, the other thing happens, in which these days for some reason advance at sunset rather than at noon and they get ahead of Tolkien, of, of the 260 day system. And that system before into the Maya, it comes perhaps from central Mexico. Wrote a paper about it, uh, had a lot of discussion. Uh, but it's interesting because it also implies that, say, even though everyone agrees on the nature of the system, there are these some kind of fundamental differences like little, and they're, they're lurking beneath. And we don't necessarily notice them because to us, day is a natural thing. We've got so used to the 24 hour system that we kind of don't think about it that much. But in Mesoamerica, apparently they didn't have full agreement, especially on Sundays, like that they agreed upon. But in terms of the suns, how you actually count the suns from sunrise to sunrise, from sunset to sunset, from noon to noon, there seems to be some level of disagreement. So in central Mexico, it appears they counted from sunset to sunset at the time of the classic Maya. The Mayas themselves, most likely counted either from sunrise to sunrise or from noon to noon. And so sometimes we get weird discrepancies, uh, but it has to be like a lot of specific circumstances to see them, right? They have to specifically talk about an event, for example, that happened right after sunset or an event that happened in the middle of the night. And the author of the text has to be very like insistent on specifically saying that, right? Like someone arrived, but not just at any random time of the day, but at midnight or at sunset. But it's cool because when it does happen, then suddenly we have this extra level of information, right? There actually, the time of the day is important. Because of course, Maya have no hours like us. There's no reference to that. And timekeeping, you just say basically at sunrise, at sunset, at midnight, uh, or sometimes we'd say right afternoon in present day Turkey, but not in hieroglyphic inscriptions. So kind of extra layer of information. 
when you read a hieroglyph inscription, there's also a large chunk of the text that would be about counting time. So instead of just saying, and then on the next day, which would be like two weeks from now, uh, something happened. They would actually say, and then in exactly 13 days from the previous time, something happened. And if it's a larger period of time, they would painstakingly count those days and months and years, very much like the loan count, but in reverse order. Instead of saying like 400 years, 20 years, years, months, days, in those so-called distance numbers, that's just a nickname, right? Uh, they would say, say two, uh, 13 days and two months since using the special suffix that means hence or go. So uh, in this case would be ushla hun hel cha o ka winiki. And here, washak la hun hel washak winiki. So uh, these, because they have numeral classifiers, lot and hell, those are usually dropped in writing, so we don't see to see them in, in those distance numbers. So a lot of my inscriptions just counting time. And you think like, why is it so important? But to the Maya, time itself is something to report. It's almost like a physical fabric of things. So it's important to name it exactly. Although I do have one text that just says Utaka, which means like time passed, there is this king. Time passed, there is this king. Time passed, there is that king, like total of six kings. But then they had limited space, just one row from limited letter size. And I guess they decided that they just can't, there'll be like no dates. There are no dates in that text at all, which is a little weird. Maybe because they were a little like not certain on dates because they had six, they have six kings, kings for 200 years. And it seems very unlikely. Uh, it's most likely they eliminated some people from the list and that created some gaps and they didn't want to talk about it. So they decided to have no dates whatsoever. Just, that's, that's the total interpreted the way you want. Like no false information either, just no information. Um, so sometimes we're helped by these expressions. They had fancy names, posterior date indicator, interior date indicator. Those were from when people couldn't read. What they do is that they basically facilitate the flow of the narrative. So Uhti, since it happened. So you say, and three days and two months since that happened. Uh, then it happened. So sometimes they would say, Uhti, Uhti, since it happened, then it happened. Uh, like in the narrative, like two days since it happened, then it happened. And you can also say, Ipasa, and a dawn. Uh, and in some, in some texts, they prefer to say patlach rather than uhti. Uhti means happened. Patlach means to take shape. So as we would say, like happened versus came to pass. They're just different artistic flourishes. Uh, and aka literally means something bundled. And that refers to time and count. So you can translate it as the count thus is, or uh, the time passed. Uh, so we see these things and they clue us that they're you know, talking about the span of time. And they usually name that span of time in the narrative itself. So this is an example. We still have a little bit of time of how you do it. This is a Maya monument. Now, the screen is actually much bigger than the real Maya monument. This thing is actually this big, small. And it's a funeral tombstone. Uh, to this fella, whose name was Kind of thought better here, I guess. Chak tok tun ni ak cham ya. Chak tok tun ak chani. Red flint stone turtle death. That was his name, and you can see he has a nice belt buckle with a big deaf head. He must have been a tough guy. Uh, and so this text has a lot of dates. Uh, in fact, that is a date, that is a date, that is a date. That's the first event. And then there's distance numbers and dates. There's another distance number. There's another distance number. It's very helpful for basically tracking how Maya people report a time. This is a tombstone. So it's a life story of the person. Well, red, red flintstone, turtle death. Uh, uh, right here, 
and he's shown with a spear. I like this kind of kind of flies in the wind. He has a headdress with a hummingbird in it. So he dressed as a warrior. And a shield, but probably he's dancing because he has a really fancy backrack behind him. So it's some kind of war dance. And the text actually tells us about it. So our first event is dated, right? Nine, peak, 10, week, hub, 11, hub, eight months, week, and then 14 days on the day six, Jaguar. Now remember, Jaguar is not a good day, but six Jaguar doesn't fall in the unhappy week of one Jaguar. So it's a, it's a crappy day, but not necessarily the worst possible option. Like it's like people who are born on an average day, right? You can be born an auspicious day, promising creative abilities, or like day one Lord promising leadership positions in society. This is someone who was born on a generic day. Like most of us had to work hard to achieve something in life. Now, uh, uh, and he was born on the month of Chakat. We don't know what it means, literally red dwarf or maybe red wife. Uh, uh, so perhaps something related to relationships between gods, but not very clear. And it was day 17 of that month. And that's his birth. It's a Sia was born red flint stone, young turtle death. So I guess red flint stone was like personal name and turtle death, they're like they're all turtle deaths. His dad was turtle death, his grandfather was a turtle death. The turtle death family. Uh, who knows why they were called turtle deaths? I guess they killed the turtle at some point in their family history. Uh, the scar, the scourge of turtles. Uh, uh, one of the local places is actually called the place of a lot of turtles, the site of El Tayo, just a few kilometers from this location. Uh, so I guess they had an opportunity to kill turtles if they wanted to. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so, and then the text mentions his parents. Of course, they were all turtle deaths. His dad, his mom was not a turtle deaf. Uh, she was uh, a turtle, uh, turtle or shom. I don't know what turtle or shom is, but uh, his dad was uh, uh, much turtle deaf. I don't know what much is. And there was a house, the provincial governor, his parents. So they were not royalty. They were more, more like bureaucracy, like in charge of uh, uh, towns in the kingdom. So middle class family. Uh, reasonable day of birth. Uh, and, and then you have a distance number. So how much time it is? Can you count for me? Seven, Seven days, four months, one, month. one year. No, no, what would be after one year? Like larger unit of time. 20 years. So nothing happened in his life for 41 year and four months. Remember, 41 long count years, so 360 day years. So, but given the extra four months, it's pretty much 41 years. So 41 year, for 41 year, nothing exceptional happened in his life. Uh, I guess he was doing things, but not worth mentioning. And then at dawn, he pass up at dawn. On this day, eight emish, the day four of the number of push. The text actually says, Aktah, he danced in Sakyakna, literally white tobacco string house. That was the name of the main royal palace of the capital of his kingdom. Yita, he was accompanied by Yonal Ach, Kohul Yokibahal, divine lord of Yokib, his kingdom. Ti Ushhablat, in the third year, presumably of the reign. So in the third year of the reign of the new king, this guy was invited and he danced with the king of the palace. The highlight of his life. It's in the center and that's him dancing or right after the dance. 41 year, 41 year old uh, dancing with the king. And then there's another distance number. So this is probably eight rather than seven, kind of hard to guess in this case. And then another seven months. Seven years, and then it happened. U of T on the day eleven Maluk, day twelve on the month of Chakat. He got a job. Koyachti sahalil, chakt ok tunach tani ukati yonal acht. So he got a job. He was promoted into full governorship of of the province, uh, like his dad. 
once. Uh, and he, the king he danced with basically appointed him. That was seven years after dancing. Uh, he was 48. He finally got his first job. My world, our world, sometimes not so different, but it's just a message to us all, like never give up, never surrender. You may still get your dance with a king or someone important, age 41, and then seven years later, there'll be a job for you. Uh, uh, and then there's another distance number. Uh, so how much is that? 14 days, three months. 16. Oh, 20 has this little bracket thing, right? And this one is, they're like next to each other, right? 16 years and uh, 120 year. So 20, 36 years, 36 years later, 36 years later. Oh, he died. Oh. <laughs> well, amazingly, and, and the text apparently is amazed by that too. They say uh, uh, nine days, 15 months, four years and four 20 year cycles since he was born, then he died. So they're fairly like, it's an emphasis. He lived for freaking 84 years, out of which he spent half his life jobless, but never losing hope. The jobless meaning he was like a subsistence farmer? Probably not. He was, he was a probably a warrior of some sort, like going to you know missions, distinguishing himself in battle, you know, taking captives, no, it's not mentioned, but like doing, like errands, but not holding a firm position in society. This should be in that young man category, right? Yeah, it's basically like being a member of the noble family, like a medieval baron, but not actually holding that, like not being in charge of anything, being given like a specific job by the king, right? A position in, in, at the court, being able to attend ceremonies and hold the cup or do things like that. He said he was basically running around, going to war, you know, trying to basically waiting for his moment of glory, right? Moment of fame. And that moment came when he danced with the king. Uh, and then uh, it says that on, on this date, someone else became king. And interestingly, they don't mention the name of the father, presumably because that's the father. So his, his son became king. Uh, oh, sorry. His son became uh, provincial ruler. Sorry. Just to sell, yes. Well, in this case, they use all of them to mention his birthday, right? So long count, nine day week, uh, lunar calendar, and then the, the Tolkien, of course, the 260 day system, and then the solar year. That's his birthday in all of these. But of course, when you think about fate, they would probably think of him as, 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 a, as a, you know, uh, as a seven Jaguar person, right? Like, like that's his actual birth date. Yeah, but he said someone was 84 years old. Or, or they, because they, they, they mention it in, in, in yeah. all of these calendars. But you know what, it's like doing it off a 260 day and 35, like, that's not going to be something that you would have been. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a long count here, right? They're not like our birthdays. Uh, and that's interesting too, because they don't really talk about people's age this way. They say, since this many, this many long count days, years, months, since the person was born. Now, how am I talk about their age? Actually, you count your cartoons, you count how many 20 year cycles you live through. So when I say I am in my forties, so I am a three cartoon person and my third 20 year cycle, as we would see sometimes like a two score person, a three score person, or when we describe say military service, maybe we describe like a one score, two score, like before, you know, uh, retirement. So the same way Maya think of this sums as being like X number of scores of years person. Uh, that's how you report your age actually. So you say like, I, 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 it, you either mature or immature, but that's like one completely different frame of reference, right? And then how many scores of years you have? So this person was in his fifth score. That would be his age. They wanted to report his age. But here, you just emphasize the length of time 
since his birth. Now, whether or not Maya had birthdays, we don't know. It doesn't seem to be the case. And you can kind of see how it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a birthday because your birth actually falls on different times of the year in the 260 day cycle. It makes no sense to, re to repeat it on a certain solar year because it's not really important. Your real like name day happens every 260 days. And that's what really matters in terms of your fate, your job, those things. Uh, and it concludes interestingly with his burial and, uh, and a ritual that was basically an honoring ritual that some people basically deserved. And the fact that the king sponsored it. And, and this monument was actually a gift from the king, so apparently to his faithful vessel. So it's kind of interesting because it means that he secured a job for his son while he was still alive, which is interesting too. And it seems to be very important. And of course, this is something that his son commissioned, right? It's not his monument, he was already dead. Uh, so this is like, this is what Maya think about proper life, right? Being born in a good family, work hard, get to know your king, get a job, uh, live a very long life, have kids, have those kids get the same job, right? Uh, and, and then of course, get proper burial, proper rituals. And this would be called the name stone about to kneel so that your, your ancestors could name you, could remember you and make, you know, may bring you offerings for, for your soul. So that would be like a life well lived and for 84 years. And I'm sure, I mean, they were obviously proud that he lived for that long. Uh, and, and so you kind of see how time figures into the narrative. Time is very important here. The fact that he waited so long for the job. And of course, this text is completely, there are no emotions. They don't say it was bad or it was good. Maya texts usually don't say that. You're like, your readership, you're supposed to understand. I mean, it's obviously a very patient wait. They don't say that dancing with the king was important, but they place it right in the middle. And he's shown, presumably dressed for a war dance. So that's, that's obviously a highlight. They don't say that the gift from the king is important, but the letters which say that this is a gift from the king, the name of the cover who did the money, they're actually larger than the rest of the text. Uh, and this monument is about a quarter of size of a similar panel that would have been carved for a king for the royal temple. So basically there's also a hierarchy there. Uh, it's also large enough for one person to carry. It. Uh, uh, so without breaking the back. Uh, so it must have been probably made at the capital and then brought to the town where that person left and then placed in his funeral shrine until unfortunately it was looted and ended up in the museum in Washington DC where it is now. But that's another story. So that's all. I hope you learned something about my calendar. There'll be no assignments about calendar, right? You concentrate on your essays. If you have any questions about essays, please let me know.